All right, uh, it's four o'clock. We have about 137 participants. Uh, I think it's a nice moment to start. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Welcome to Topology Optimization Webinar. Uh, my name is Jun Wu from Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this event. Um, Topology Optimization Webinar is initiated by colleagues from Delft University of Technology and Technical University of Denmark. Today is the third session. We are very pleased to have Professor Gan Dongcheng and Professor Xu Guo to uh, host today's webinar. Uh, in the past few weeks, they did a great job to solicit TED Talks and to invite speakers, and then they will chair this session. Uh, thank you, Professor Chen and Professor Guo. Uh, now the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Professor Wu, uh, for your very wonderful introduction. So, uh, okay, I think it is time to get started now. So, dear colleagues before the screen, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I and Professor Cheng, uh, both from Dalian University of Technology, are very pleased to have the opportunity to see the colleagues from all over the world to join uh, the third top webinar. Today, to actually, we have uh, 313 registered participants for this webinar, and now, uh, we are now having about uh, more than 100 people in the meeting room. And, and I think this number will continue to increase as the webinar proceeds. Uh, this webinar is also endorsed by ISMO. So, okay, uh, today we have five invited talks from colleagues in different areas. So actually, we, will, we have one keynote presentation and four other ones. So as a rule, the keynote speaker has 15 minutes and the other speaker has eight minutes respectively to present. We, have, we also have five minutes to discuss for each uh, presentation. So we also have uh, 15 minutes for general discussion after all presentations have been completed. So uh, during the uh, webinar, if you want to raise questions, please notify us by shaking your hands or input the questions using the chatting function provided by the software we will bring your questions to the speakers. So thank you once again for joining us webinar. So uh, next, let us welcome Professor Qian uh, from the University of Wisconsin at Madison to deliver the first keynote presentation. Let us welcome uh, Professor uh, Qian, please share your screen. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen? Okay, it's perfect. Okay. Please go ahead. Yes. Okay. okay. Please go ahead. Yeah. Got it. Thanks for the colleagues in Delft and Denmark for initiating the webinar. And thanks for Professor Chen and Professor Guo for inviting me here. I'm happy to have the opportunity to share with you our recent work on simultaneous optimization of topology and build orientation for additive manufacturing. This work is done by my student, Chen Fu, here. So additive manufacturing is gaining popularity for some time now. It can build very complex parts. The reason is it utilizes support structures. How to remove support structure is a challenge issue, it can be challenging. And in the case of matter manufacturing, this is a paper in 2011, you can see how to use wild EDM to remove the support in from matter additive manufacturing is a challenge. There's a lot of work in this area. There's also support structures here, for example, how do you design support structure based on the load where you have to support. But you can see in all these cases, support structure depends on both boundary slope as well as build orientation. So here we want to address how can we account for build orientation in the design of support structures. So let's look at a basic problem, what do we have? This is a common beam problem in topology optimization. We see very often, you can see it depends, the support structure depends on the boundary slope of the geometry you have. If you have the slope C here, slope facing upward, you don't need support. B, you need support in location A. Well, uh, you sorry, sorry, sorry. Ping, sorry to interrupt. I don't think we see your slides. You have to make it the uh, presentation mode. We only see the first one. Can you see my screen now? 
something is it's black for now it's black oh, now yeah. yeah it's in the second it's the can yeah. you see a screen now yeah. yeah it's just a problem analysis is it yeah okay. yeah okay. okay perfect thanks for letting me know so as you can see in the point location abc where you might need support really depends on the boundary slope so that's what we have. You see, facing up, you don't need support here. Depends on the overhead angle, you could build a part without support. And this is a challenge issue in topology optimization. We would like to use gradient-based approach. So the, how can we relate support with point-wise density is an interesting and a challenging issue. And there has a lot of work in this area, including Jamie Gast and Langler, and Professor Chen, as well as our colleague, Shurish, and including level set based approach from Alaire and Professor Kang Tan. And there are many other work in this area. So I'm, I know I have left out some important contribution. But in all this work, we're assuming it is a fixed orientation. But we know this support structure depends on orientation. So here's the example. For the same beam structure, if you rotate the structure clockwise, you can see the A domain, you don't need support. If you rotate the other way, oops. Now you only this part needs support. If you rotate a little bit further, you can see this entire part can be built without support structure. So clearly the amount of support is not differentiable with respect to build orientation. And we would like to make it differentiable in the contact topology optimization, so we can use gradient-based optimization. And this is a challenge we want to talk about today, and we are not the first one to do this work. I know Professor Ko has been using implicit TO or MMMC to attack similar issue, and Langlaire has been attempting this issue from sampling orientation. So what we want to do is, can we develop approach, gradient-based approach? And this idea is built on a concept we developed some time ago. So assume you have a design domain, this is a part, this is build orientation B. We want to control the amount of support via this horizontal length, we call project undercut perimeter P, this shaded area. If P goes to zero, then you don't need support. So that's the basis of our work. And how do we compute that? So in density based approach, here in the solid, gamma equal to one here, void gamma equal to zero. If you take gradient, we give you this direction. If you take a dot product with respect to build orientation, that's a directional derivative of density. This essentially corresponds to cosine alpha, where alpha is the overhang. So how do we compute that? We basically do a volume integral of this directional derivative. And then we're using a heavy size threshold, depends on slope facing up, facing down, and then do a volume integral. And this has a geometric meaning of measuring the undercut length in 2D, undercut surface area in 3D. So that is the basis of our work. We proposed this formulation in 2017. And this, as you can see, this PUP measure is differentiable with respect to density gamma, as well as build orientation B. What we're going to show here is to explore how can we explore this formulation's differentiability with respect to B. So for a fixed build orientation, for same beam structure, if you look at directional derivative, you can see C, at the location C, it's downward, it's a negative. At location B, it's positive, facing downward. And A, it's slightly downward, so the intensity is a bit lower. If you do a heavy size thresholding, that's what you have. Everything that's remaining after heavy size thresholding is the area where you could potentially need support structure. If we do volume integral, that basically corresponds to the horizontal length of the area that needs support. So in this two design, the horizontal length are both two. For example, here, horizontal length is two. Of course, one has a higher greenness, the other one has lower greenness. But the PUP measure is integral of this one measures the horizontal length that needs support structure. 
So that is the basis of our formulation. It's uh, reasonably straightforward. Here we give formulation minimum compliance, equilibrium equations, volume constraint. This is a PUP constraint, how much PUP would allow. And in our earlier formulation, we also added a density greatness constraint. More recently, our students seem to be reporting that this may not be needed if we're using other material interpretation or play with heavy set filter. And here's a short summary example. If the 3D beam structure, if we do not use any overhang PUP constraint, this is horizontal length about 3.6, and this is the design we have. If we use PUP constraint from 2, 1.5 to a very small number, you can see the amount of un undercut has been reduced. So this, this P essentially can choose the amount of undercut. And we can use the same idea to control the overhead angle. Instead of constraining everywhere that's facing downward, we constrain location where it was undercut smaller than alpha zero. So that so we change the heavy side filter, uh, heavy side from positive negative direction derivative to the overhead angle here. With that, we can have a PUP based formulation for overhead angle. Here is 2D beam structure. If we do not have any overhead angle, that's what we have. If we impose 15, 30, 45, 60, 75 degrees, and that's the design we have. You can see the minimum overhead angle is actually overlaid here. We can clearly control the overhead angle. And when you impose this overhead angle constraint, when you tighten it, the cost function becomes better. So the design works it off into the into the. And we can extend this idea easily to 3D. Here's the topology optimal design using commercial FDM machine. This is support structure. If we're using open source FDM machine, this part, same part can be built. This is in the FDM machine without any support structure. And this is the part we have. And what we have presented to you so far is a build orientation based on PUP, where differentiability with respect to density is explored. Now let's look at build orientation. So here's the example my student came up. If I have a 2D hook, this side is fixed. This is a loading here. If you just apply TO, this is the design you have. So he chose this hook example is to show that there's no orientation under which you can print the part with, without support structure. So then in this case, here's his optimization result. Here we define build orientation B, actually parameterized by a horizontal angle theta with respect to horizontal axis. We can still control a overhead angle which is alpha bar. In this case, the optimized result is along this direction. So if I build this part, this is horizontal plate, this is build direction, then this part can be printed without any support. So let's look at how we're doing this one. So here, we're still using control PUP. Notice we are actually exploring the differentiability with respect to B. So if the horizontal PUP lens with respect to overhead angle alpha bar here, if I rotate this build orientation, this PUP become this way. And so this controls the support structure in the design domain. And Trinfu also extend this concept to control support structure outside of design domain. If I build part this way, then there's a lot of support between the design domain and the horizontal plate. So he can develop a measure Q, which is similar to this one, but the boundary is known. So he defined this measure Q. And here, let's see, looking at direction derivative, how does it change when the build orientation changes? If it's a vertical B, this ABC, you can see the direction derivative. And after heavy side filter, that's what you have. And whatever remaining is the overhead angle smaller than alpha bar. If I change orientation from here to here, you can see this area no longer remains. So this part can be built without any support. If I rotate further, this top without any support. As you can see, this whole directional derivative is clearly differentiable with respect to build orientation with gradually changing. So that's a basis so we can incorporate this formulation in 
gradient-based optimization. So here we do the same thing for 3D. For 3D, we're going to parameterize orientation B with two angles, theta and a sine. And we can visualize this angle theta, uh, actually here, be should sure phi and a sine in a sphere. So two angles can be projected on a sphere. And now we have three optimization variables. One is density field, one is two build orientation angle corresponds to B. This is cost function, equilibrium equation, volume constraint. This is PUP in the design domain. This is Q outside the design domain with respect to base plate. And here, let's look at some of the examples. This is common beam structure. If no overhead constraint, this is the design we have. And if I have overhead angle 45 degrees with fixed build orientation vertical B, and this is the design we have. As you can see, cost function goes up, but overhead angle is satisfied. Now, if I choose this direction, build a direction will optimize. This is still design. You can see the optimal design is pretty much same as the original design. That's because this design is nicely, it can be printed without support. Now, if I use optimization, we can see, we can also find the same as this one. So this is actually orientation automatically optimized. Now, we have to have an initial orientation. Initial orientation is actually 45 degrees. After rotation, this becomes 90 degrees. So let's see the evolution of angle and the density. So here to show the builder orientation evolution, I'm actually fixed builder orientation, rotated design domain. So initial orientation is 45 degrees. After 25 iteration, 50, 100 to 200, this is the orientation we have. As you can see, this part can be built if I allow 45 degree overhead angle. In the process, you can see the density evolve from here to here. This rotation of design domain shows the angle change. And also you can see the POP constraint from here to gradually only along the tangent active line, the boundary where the POP constraint is active. Here, the initial angle is 45 degrees. We can try different initial, initial angles. We can try instead of 45, zero degrees, we still converge to same 90 degree overhead angle here. So this is 90 degrees initially vertical here. Now, if I rotate initial angle to be 135, this, this is a design slightly different from this one. Keep in mind, although the topology is the same, but build orientation is very different. One is built from this up. This is go this up. As you can see, this part can also be built with base plate here and this one. The cost function is about the same. As you can see, this, this is a convergence of angle, compliance, and the volume constraint. And then we can extend this idea to the 2D hook example. This is without overhead angle. And this is with overhead angle, assume a build orientation. This is simultaneous optimization. You can see the cost function becomes better then assume a fixed orientation. This gives you an animation of the evolution of both orientation as well as the density. So if you can see here, we can do simultaneous optimization of topology orientation. And as this iteration goes on, the angle compliance volume becomes steady. And we have some oscillation here because where we change update beta in the heavy side filter. And then we look at some 3D example. Our formulation is easily amenable to 3D. This is another bracket example with load here, here is fixed. If a no slope constraint, this is the design. You can see you have internal support as well as support outside the design domain. If I control the P and the Q, this is the design you have. And this is if you print this part, very little support is needed this, this, this example. And I'll point one more example, 3D cantilever B. If I don't use any support constraint, you can see this is the design you have. You need a, quite some support. This is black one, the support here. And if I optimize orientation and topology, this is the optimal design. This is a different views. You can see if I look at this way, this part can be built without any support. This is the animation of the optimized design.
Here we show you the animation of the optimization process. We're using sphere to show the evolution of the angles. And this shows two views of density. As you can see this angle, initially there's a large angle change. The color of this point on the sphere represents the cost function. And then this is the optimized part. You can see this part can be printed without any support inside of the design domain. And if we cut it, and then we can see, analyze the boundary slope, it is 45 degrees. So 45 degrees angle is satisfied. And if we impose a constraint on the base plate and the design domain, this is the part we have. So this part will have very little support, both inside domain and outside the design domain. So if you look at cost function, when we impose the support constraint, it does lead to increase of cost function here. And this is and work done by Trinfu here. Here's a conclusion. We introduce a directional deriv derivative based PUP formulation. It has clear geometric meaning. It's easy to compute and differentiate. It's differentiable with respect to both density orientation. The same idea can be applied in level set based formulations. And we have explored for undercut control, overhead angle control. Here we're trying to apply in good orientation optimizations. And this work is appeared in Journal of Additive Manufacturing. One of the downside of this formulation is it could have boundary oscillation. And recently I've been working with Francesco come up a treatment based on second order derivative that can overcome this oscillation. You can see the, this publication in JCP this year. And this is our original publications. And that's all I have. Thanks for your attention. I'd be happy Thank to you, answer questions. Okay. Thank you, Professor Chen, uh, for your very uh, interesting presentation. So now it is time for discussion. Uh, any questions or comments? Uh, I have one question. When you orient it, can I ask now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, okay. one small question. Uh, when you cut, we orient it. I can see you need a lot of support underneath, right? Do you plan to take that also into account? Because that's also expensive, like here, right? So, yes, if I only impose PUP constraint in the design domain, this part can be printed without any support in the design domain. But there's a lot of support between the design domain and the base plate. So that's yeah. why to introduce another measure Q. When you import, import a smaller Q, this is the design you have. Yeah, okay. So we, we do precisely like what you described. Well, we have a formulation. This Q is about. So this Q okay. can show the support between design domain and the base plate. Then, uh, yeah. yeah. Then how could you choose the up bound? Alpha uh, overhead angle. When we studied orientation, we chose 45 degrees. But earlier we showed you this alpha can be dependent on manufacturing process mm -hmm. you have. You can control the alpha. For example, okay. here you can control the alpha. Unless you're talking about dynamically updating alpha depending on location. In that case, we have not done that. We uh, assume a fixed alpha. You can choose whatever alpha you want. Good, thanks. Can I Excuse follow me. Can I follow up on that question? So I think also Feng Wen meant, how do you choose uh, P bar and Q bar? So it seems to be critical values to choose to make it all work. So is there some systematic way to do that? Yeah. So initially we choose P by if I want to have amount of undercut you want to control. If you do not want any control at all, this P bar, you can, can, you can be normalized by the, the design domain horizontal area. Let's say horizontal area is one inch square. Let's say I want to the allowed undercut area perhaps 1% of the horizontal area to normalize project area. That would be a good basis to play with it. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you do need to play with it, I guess, especially when you also introduce Q, Q bar. Right? That's right. Yeah. But that but, one could argue has clear geometric meaning. How much support you would allow? Yeah. Well, it looks good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I have uh, one question. Yeah. But, yeah. This is being you. So I want to know: so Do you consider the printing process when you rotate the structure? Uh, I'm not sure I quite follow your question. Here, the printing process has been abstracted to just say overhead angle control, 45 degrees or 60 or 30 degrees. Can you, I'm not sure that, okay, I'm not sure about your question, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I have one question. Professor sure. Chung? Yeah. I have one question. You, in your design, you can see that there's a sharp corner always there. I mean, in some design. Can you avoid that? Sharp corner? Yeah, you, you, you show some picture, not this yeah. one, this one in yeah. the uh, Two dimensional picture. You have some two dimensional picture? Not that one, the, the design you obtain. For example, this one, the corner is also always very short. No, this one, yeah. This one, yeah, o always very sharp corner there. Oh, that's an interesting question. I'm one, uh, I haven't thought about it. I'm wondering if one could use filtering to smooth it out. Sure. Yeah. Are, you, are you concerned about stress constraint? We, we haven't thought about the sharp corner. I assume uh, one could- just, uh, introduce the stress of concentration. Yeah, <laughs> good point. Yeah. I, okay. It would be interesting to see if a filter could uh, suppress that sharp corner. Yeah. Okay. But uh, okay. with a smooth corner- okay. okay, thank you, Professor Chen. Uh, okay, thanks, everyone. Here to the schedule, so I must close the discussion. We also have the, uh, the, the we, we can also have discussion uh, in the general discussion uh, stage. So thank you once again for your very wonderful presentation. So, thank you. Um, okay, so the next speaker is Professor Jian Bindu from Tsinghua University. The topic of his presentation is uh, of topology of top of optimization of a uh, phononic-like structure to turn the band gap of the structure uh, in the context of multi-scale optimization. So please, Professor uh, Du. Okay, thank you, Professor Guo. Please I will share my screen. Okay. Okay. So, uh, can you see the screen? Perfect. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jian Bindu. I'm from Tsinghua University. And uh, the topic of my presentation uh, is concerned uh, with the design of phononic like structures and band gap tuning by concurrent two scale topology optimization. This is a co work with my former student, uh, Dr. Xuan Liang. Uh, my talk will be focused on the second part, but uh, I will also give a brief uh, extension of this work connecting additive manufactured lattice in field in the third part. Uh, as we know, in engineering, a very often considered uh, problem is vibration, uh, sound isolation, and mitigation. Uh, such a problem can be dealt with by uh, active control or a passive design. In this presentation, we are mainly focused on the latter one. And during recent years, such a design problem has benefited a lot from the topology optimization. If we look into uh, in detail some vibroacoustic structures or materials used in engineering, a patterns of composites with periodically repeated microstructures can often be found. Such periodicity enhances to a great extent the designability of the microstructures. 
Thus, it is nature for us to apply the microstructure design or even a two-scale design uh, uh, for the problem, which is also known as metamaterial structure design. As for the phononic crystal, uh, which is also known as PNC, is a periodically functional uh, material. Uh, in the recent years, study of PNC has a hot topic due to its particular characteristics of band gap. For example, forbidding waves like elastic or sound waves propagation in specified uh, frequency gaps. This can be shown by the uh, dispersion plot uh, uh, as shown in the right hand side. In practice, uh, there are two ways of band gap tuning. Uh, the first way is based on the uh, so-called, uh, on the right-hand side, the so-called block wave solution, uh, where the periodic microstructure uh, can be analyzed by the wave equation at the micro units level, and uh, is converted to an eigenvalue problem, uh, which gives the relation between the frequency and uh, the wave vector, uh, by which the dispersion curves can be plotted. However, there are some limitations of this method. For example, it requires identical periodicity everywhere uh, and it's difficult to deal with the mixed domain. The method is difficult to be connected with the specified boundary and loading conditions of the macrostructure. Uh, another way is the homogenization based uh, solution, uh, which first calculates uh, the equivalent macromodulars of the periodic microstructure then the normal macro level analysis and the design can be performed. It is easy to handle the mixed domain, which uh, where each subdomain may have different periodic microstructures. And uh, it is also easy to consider the specific boundary and loading conditions of the macrostructure and easy to be extended to two scale design. So in our work, we, uh, we mainly use the second way to do uh, this design. Uh, to do so, we have developed uh, a two-scale optimization model to combine several parts together. Uh, firstly, the palm multi-material interpolation models are employed to implement, to implement the topology design concurrently at both micro and macro level. Uh, then a second, uh, a two-scale analysis are performed, uh, where at macro level, the traditional vibroacoustic analysis is performed. And, micro, and uh, at micro level, the equivalent uh, material properties are calculated based on homogenization method. Uh, thirdly, a two-scale sensitivity analysis and uh, optimization is performed for both macro uh, and micro level. Uh, and the, the MMA method is employed to solve the problem. Okay, uh, in our problem, the design objective is minimization of the transmission coefficient of the sound power flow, we call it STC. The sound power flow uh, is uh, defined by using the pressure and the velocity as the surface of the vibrating structure, which in principle may be obtained by solution of the structure and uh, uh, acoustic uh, coupling equations. And uh, the sound power in different areas of the boundary can be used to evaluate the specified acoustic uh, transmission properties of the structure. Uh, we assume that, the, uh, for example, we assume that uh, the area SI denotes the harmonic excitation load applies, uh, is defined as the input area of the vibroacoustic uh, power. And uh, the specified boundary surface area SO uh, denotes, uh, uh, denotes the part uh, where the target or output area of the sound radiation. Then the STC is uh, defined as a ratio between the pi SO uh, divided by pi si. Uh, this slide shows the, uh, the material model, a two-scale multi-material interpolation model. Uh, and the final design variables consist of uh, the microstructure design variables. Uh, here it's the lambda and the mu, and uh, the macro level design variables uh, rho. So uh, uh, because time is limited, so I just skip this. Uh, uh, this slide shows uh, an example of two uh, of the material, uh, the, the two-scale material model. We show a case of two base material and two mat material. For example, at the macro level, the macro structure consists of two uh, uh, mat materials. Uh, uh, each mat material corresponds to a, a kind of micro structures. Uh, here we use the uh, mat material one uh, denoted by this uh, cyan color. 
and uh, the metal material too, uh, denoted by the yellow color. And uh, at, macro, at, at micro level, and each microstructure uh, consists of two base of materials. And the base material one denoted by this blue color, uh, for example, this is a microstructure one. It uh, consists of two uh, base material. Uh, the blue one is the base material one, and the green one is the base material two. And uh, uh, similarly, for the second metal materials, and uh, the microstructure also consists of this kind, uh, these two base materials. Uh, this is the flow chart of the two scale uh, topology optimization. Uh, uh, actually, uh, we can see uh, firstly, we set the initial uh, design variable, the value of the design variables, then after uh, the micro uh, structure uh, FEA analysis, we get the equivalent uh, uh, modulus of the, of the materials, and then we do the uh, calculation of the macro structure. Uh, uh, which is which corresponds to the structure and web, uh, uh, acoustic uh, analysis, and then after sensitivity analysis, we can do this optimization search to improve the design variables at both uh, micro and macro level. Okay, now let's see some numerical examples. Uh, the first example uh, is to check the band gap calculated by uh, two different methods we have mentioned ju uh, just now. Where the benchmark example at the left hand side, uh, upper side, comes from the paper by Wang, uh, 2013, where a dimensionless band gap uh, from 0 0.61 to 0 0.82 can be found. And here in this example, the base material is rubber, the green part. Uh, in our test, uh, a macrostructure should be considered. Uh, it's con constructed by the 8 by 10. Unite cell array subjected to a pressure loading at the center of the left side. Uh, the out area, output area of the sound power is the boundary at the right hand side. Uh, for the frequency response curve, we can see uh, we perform the uh, frequency response and uh, we get this curve and the two band gap can be identified. The first band gap uh, is from 0 0.51 to 0 0.62. And the second band gap from 0 0.64 to 0 0.78. So we can see there are some difference between uh, the benchmark example and our tests. Um, the reason uh, is there some, uh, uh, because the conditions, there are some uh, difference. Uh, for example, uh, it should be noted that in our paper, a band gap will be identified approximately where the sound transmission coefficients are not greater than 0 0.1 for all the frequencies in the interval. Meanwhile, the interval widths should be considerably large to be treated as a gap, as shown uh, by this shadow, the uh, rectangular uh, area. Moreover, the identified band gap is actually a partial band gap in uh, our work, since we only consider transmission of the 2D domain in single wave propagation direction in this paper. This is somewhat different from the traditional uh, concept of band gap, uh, which is usually determined by analyzing uh, transmission property in all directions over a typical uh, Bruy uh, Lewis, uh, Lewis zone. Uh, from this point, so the, uh, the band gap property studied in this paper uh, can be uh, regarded as an interval of wave in installation. Uh, certainly, uh, in the, the influence of the size of the macrostructure. Uh, the microstructure and the boundary and the loading conditions can be fully included in our study. Okay, uh, this slide shows the size effect of the microstructure. So in order to uh, investigate the influence of the size of a microstructure, we, uh, the microstructure and the boundary and the load, uh, uh, we reduce the size of the microstructure by a half of the original one. Uh, for example, the right, uh, the, the picture on the right hand side is half size of the original uh, structure. Uh, so we can see uh, the band gap identified. Uh, they have some uh, very big difference. So we can see the size effect is very important uh, in the uh, two scale studies. Okay. Uh, now we consider a two scale topology optimization for band gap uh, tuning. Uh, the size of the micro microstructure, the boundary and the loading conditions uh, are the same as the first example. And uh, the two base material 
here are selected as the rubber and the aluminum alloy. The total volume on, uh, fraction of the uh, aluminum, uh, aluminum alloy in the whole microscopic design domain is limited to uh, 40%. And that in the first metal material is set as 67%. Uh, we calculate uh, the sound radiation power uh, in the input and output surface and calculate the corresponding transmission uh, coefficients, we call it uh, STC, of the unif uniform initial design. So the uh, frequency response curve is uh, uh, plot uh, on the right hand side. So we can see there's no band gap between uh, the interval from 0 to 12,000 red per second. Uh, and then uh, we do some optimization at some specified uh, excitation frequencies. Uh, the first one is the uh, 3000. Uh, so the picture at the left hand side shows the optimum uh, macro uh, structure and the microstructure. Uh, and uh, the picture on the right hand side, we can see that uh, the band gap uh, is successfully uh, created by the specified excitation uh, 3000. Uh, the band gap is identified by is uh, shown by this shadow, the rectangular part. And uh, for the excitation frequency, uh, medium uh, excitation frequency, 6,000 red per second. second. Uh, so we can see another uh, result and the optimum macrostructure topology and the microstructure topology and the band gap also uh, created successfully. And this is the, the result for the higher excitation frequency. Uh, and again, we can uh, create the band gap successfully. Uh, okay, now uh, finally, I will give a brief uh, extension of the work connecting additive manufactured lattice in fuels. Uh, so uh, to do this, uh, actually we need to do several steps to generate a modified design process. Uh, so step one, uh, a predefined microstructure pattern is introduced instead of the freely design uh, is introduced because it's easy for manufacturing. For example, uh, here we choose a cell with a rectangular hole in the center and the size of the hole is designable, which corresponds to variation of the material volume density of the microstructure. And in step two, a series of sample uh, tensor tests are performed instead of homogenization calculation to obtain the macro equivalent material properties of the metal material with given size of the microstructure. So you can see we choose four samples to do this test. Uh, uh, and in step three, at least the square uh, fitting is performed to find uh, the continuously uh, varied material interpolation formula, which will be used for the later design optimization of the metal material distribution over the microstructure domain. And uh, after the preparation uh, of the first three steps, then in step four, uh, a topology optimization of the mat material with the predefined microstructure pattern is performed at a macro level to obtain the desired band gap. So we can see uh, the picture on the right lower side, the dashed line uh, denotes the initial design. We can see there's no band gap and the green line, solid green line denotes uh, the, the results uh, after optimization. We can see uh, at the specified uh, excitation frequency uh, 12,000, we create successfully the band gap. And uh, the optimum uh, uh, microstructure topology as is shown on the left lower side. Uh, and in step four, uh, in, step, in, in step five, uh, we do a translation. The material mm -hmm. density uh, will be mapping, okay. Please pay attention will, to the I will finish soon. Yeah, I will finish soon. The material density mapping uh, will be mapping uh, uh, to a CAD reconstruction, uh, and uh, then we get a CAD reconstruction of the optimized structure using the lattice in fuels. Uh, so uh, we also compared uh, the STC curves and band gap properties of the regional and the post processed optimized material layout for the excited, uh, for the specified frequency, we can see the difference is uh, small. So we almost keep the band gap properties of the structure. Okay, uh, finally, I will give uh, uh, some conclusions. Uh, 
Uh, firstly, the accuracy of the determining uh, band gap property based on transmission coefficients for elastic sound propagation of the microstructure domain has been validated. Significant influence of the dimensional uh, finitude of the microstructure uh, domain on band gap feature is also shown in this way. Uh, the proposed two scale topology optimization methodology is able to create the desired band gap properties at the target uh, uh, excitation frequency. Uh, it suggests that the proposed two scale topology optimization can be a very promising tool to find the desired band gap property for the uh, microscopic uh, design domain with specified boundary conditions, even though no reasonable initial guess of the material layout in the design domain is available. Uh, finally, the method is easy to extend it, uh, uh, easy extended for band gap tuning design of the structure with additive manufactured lattice material. Okay, that's my talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Du. I think this is a very interesting topic, but for since the schedule is very tight, so I think we can exchange ideas at the uh, at the final general discussion stage. So thank okay. you once again, Professor Du. Okay, thank you. Thank so, you. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Professor Langala is from uh, uh, Deft University. Uh, the topic of his presentation is pressure, lo pressure lo loaded structure optimization using the DASI method. Please, Professor Langala. Thank you for the introduction and uh, thanks for inviting me to present this work on behalf of my co-authors who you see here. And the next eight minutes, I'll try to give you uh, the main ideas of uh, yeah, what is behind this work. And let me start by uh, giving uh, the motivation, what, what actually triggered us to look into this. That is uh, the developments in the field of uh, soft robotics. You see some examples on this slide of soft robots. These are made of uh, compliant materials. Uh, they're typically actuated with, with pressure. And uh, their potential is that they will be cheaper and safer to interact with humans, for example, like this, you see here with this uh, robot hand, than conventional uh, metal robots. So this is a very interesting field and we noticed that there is no systematic design approach to come up with these designs that act like uh, soft robots. So our aim with this work is to work towards, uh, yeah, let's say a method to automate the design of soft robotics. And the design problem is somewhat similar to a compliant mechanism design because this robot also acts as a kind of mechanism. And the difference is that uh, well, also here, the, the designer will specify uh, certain boundary conditions for the mechanism. Uh, the exact surface where the load is applied is not, is not pre-specified. So here we see an outer surface being loaded with pressure, but maybe at the end, as the result of the optimization process, we will have some kind of material distribution and a different surface that is uh, exposed to the pressure load. So that is what makes this uh, special. And that's also what makes it challenging because now that the pressure loading is actually uh, a function of the, of the density layout of the design, and it becomes design dependent. And that means we have to somehow describe where the pressure is applied in the domain. And we have also, we should calculate proper load sensitivities to include in the gradient-based optimization of, of such structures. These are the challenges. And next to that, we have a certain, uh, a short list of uh, desired properties as well. That is, uh, yeah, preferably the method should be uh, easy to implement. It should be extensible to three dimensions because these soft robots are three dimensional. And it should be compatible with the density approach because we would like to use several techniques that exist for, for that uh, framework. Now, let me mention that we are not the first to look at this. Actually, already, uh, I think there's two decades of history in uh, topology optimization for pressure loaded structures. Uh, there's no time to summarize all that. So, for this, for, for a proper review, I refer to the paper. But what I will mention is that uh, in our view, none of the existing methods really ticked all these boxes, particularly of the uh, desired properties. So that led us to uh, develop our own method. And uh, that will, is what I will introduce you next. Uh, our own method, we have called it the Darcy method, uh, is based on what is called uh, the Darcy's law. And this law describes uh, the flow through a porous medium where we have a flow uh, quantity and that is proportional to the pressure gradient in the medium. Yeah, for instance, a porous rock uh, like this. And uh, the proportionality constant, this k here, is uh, called uh, the flow coefficient. Now, if you combine this with a, a, a conservation law, you find a, a partial differential equation, the PDE, that you can use to find a pressure field. This 
key here is the pressure that we uh, that we want to identify to uh, to couple to our pressure loaded structure. So to illustrate how this works, here again I have this uh, schematic of our uh, let's say a soft robotic design. Um, on the left side there is a pressure boundary condition. On the on the left on the right side there is a, a zero pressure. And to illustrate the concept, I'm going to look at what happens along this uh, this red line. So what you see here along this line, there are several intersections with uh, the structure. So some solid density and some void density uh, regions. And if we solve our, uh, our PDE for the pressures with a density dependent uh, flow coefficient, what we get is a pressure distribution like this. This is not quite yet what we, what we like because there's now a pressure at the exposed surface, but there's also a non-zero pressure as, at an internal surface. And that is not uh, realistic. So in addition, we propose to add uh, what we call a drainage term. That is this uh, capital Q here. And yeah, you can think of it as a kind of uh, term that extracts the fluid as soon as it enters the dense regions of the, of the material. So as soon as the fluid is entering here into the structure, you can see that the pressure, there's a, there's a clear pressure drop up to zero and we do not put any pressure on the internal surfaces. So that is the, uh, the essence of how we modified this, uh, this PDE. To illustrate how this works in two dimensions, here I have another uh, schematic example. Again, on the left, there is the input pressure, and on the right, there is the output pressure, which we set to zero. And we have a certain density distribution in the domain. Now, if we apply this, this the conventional Darcy PDE with uh, density dependent uh, flow coefficient, we get this gradual uh, uh, distribution of pressure values. And that's not what we want, like in the 1D example. But if we add this drainage term, we get a completely different uh, view of the field. We get uh, the pressure drop clearly localized at the interface between the open region and the first uh, solid, uh, solid boundary. And this is what we need for, uh, for describing a proper pressure uh, distribution. Now from this pressure field, we can calculate the load factor for our uh, mechanics problem in the optimization uh, because the load factor turns out to be uh, basically proportional to the pressure gradient. So this is relatively easy to calculate as well. So to sum it all up and to give you an overview of then the, uh, the optimization loop, what we're going to do is we have our density fields. This is input for a uh, yeah, this discretized uh, Darcy problem that I showed in the previous slides. This is uh, a relatively cheap uh, linear problem because uh, we have per node only one pressure variable. So it's cheaper than the mechanical problem. And after solving for the pressures, well, from the pressures, we can calculate uh, the force factor for our mechanics problem. And from that, we calculate the displacement field. And with the displacement field, we can form uh, objectives as we like, for example, compliance or an output displacement for a mechanism and so on. And we use MMA to, uh, to close the loop. Now, MMA needs gradients, as we all know, and uh, that, uh, that be would become too messy to put that all in the same uh, picture here. The full derivation uh, you can find in the paper. I'm not going to show it here on slides, but basically it's very comparable to, for instance, the thermal mechanical uh, topology optimization problem, because we have here a sequentially coupled uh, set of two linear equations, uh, one with one DOF per node and one which is uh, the mechanics. So that is uh, actually uh, quite similar to that. Okay, time for some examples. Uh, first, uh, I will show an example, which is more a benchmark uh, problem. Um, this is the compliance minimization problem under a pressure load coming here from below. And the solution, this is the uh, expected classical solution, is a kind of arch. And if we look at the, uh, the uh, evolution process of the optimization, we see that we get quite uh, a nice convergence that looks, uh, that looks promising. Um, and also what I should mention here is that a property of our method is that it actually follows, the pressure field follows kind of the, the density field. So initially the density field is, is dispersed. And because of that also the pressure gradients are more uh, distributed and we get also loadings that are more distributed throughout the domain. And as the design is converging and the interfaces become more, more crisp, uh, uh, also the uh, the, the pressure terms, the forces due to the pressures are, are concentrated on this, these interfaces. So we think this is a desirable property uh, for basically uh, starting out in a more exploratory mode and, and then focusing on, uh, on correctly representing the pressure load. 
So encouraged by this, we also tried several uh, compliant mechanisms because that is more similar to the soft robotics application. So on this slide, what we have is a, uh, a modified uh, force inverter problem. So we have a pressure coming in from the left and this note over here, uh, we want to actually also move that to the left so that it actually is inverted. And the result of an optimization looks like this. So let me show it in full, uh, not uh, for the symmetric half. And to show that it works uh, as intended, if we look at the deformed structure, we see that it indeed moves uh, in the correct uh, direction as a, as a force inverter. Now, by playing around with, with settings, such as the output stiffness, you can create different uh, designs, for example, this one here. And uh, please notice that the pressure loaded surface now has completely changed from, from this one. So that is part of the optimization process. The optimizer finds a suitable uh, pressure loaded surface. And there are more variations that you can make. So here's an example of a gripper. There are more examples uh, in the paper. Uh, but uh, before concluding, let me show one more thing which is actually not in the paper. And that is, uh, well, we've been continuing on this topic yeah, towards uh, uh, the intended uh, soft robotics optimization. And uh, this is uh, one of the fir first uh, 3D results. The whole formulation actually also applies in 3D. So the, similar, the same PDEs you can discretize for a 3D problem. And this is an example of the gripper that we are uh, working on. So uh, to conclude, I hope I've shown you that this, this new method that we propose has some interesting properties. It has a modest uh, computational cost. It has uh, correct load sensitivities and it can be uh, applied in 3D as well. So yeah, if you ask me, can we now start uh, designing uh, soft, uh, soft robots? Well, I think for that, we still have some work to do because if you look at this picture, for example, it's clear that uh, the deflections here are large and currently our formulation is based on only linear theory. So that's there we need to do some work. And another interesting aspect is that this device relies on self-contact. It contacts its own surface and describing that is also uh, an interesting puzzle. So we still have some, uh, some steps to take there. And uh, with that, I thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Professor Langala. Uh, and now it's time for discussion. Uh, any questions or comments on this work? I have a small question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very, very interesting, very nice work. Uh, my question is the pressure uh, the loading. I mean, the, yeah, many, I mean, the pressure engineering should be constant. But I think your method, the pressure may change when you, the, the domain of the fluid increase. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, the, the pressure itself does not change because it is controlled by, let me go to a slide where... You're controlled by the boundary condition. It's controlled by the boundary condition, okay. indeed. Yeah, but, uh, but the when amount the of domain force increase, that is... Then, yes, when it, the domain increase, the pressure drops. Uh, no, actually, uh, that is not the case. Uh, but the force will increase. So you do not have direct control over how much force uh, let me go to, uh, for instance, this example. Here we see that we have a different uh, contact surface and all this entire it... surface will be uh, exposed to the same pressure as for instance, these smaller contact surfaces. So it could be that uh, as the optimizer is in control of generating the, the exposed surface, that in total you may get a different, uh, a different force. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you're found your condition is prescribed at the fixed boundary for pressure. Yes, in this case, so we assume that yeah. this is known. Yes, yeah. basically the optimizer may be able to, to close off part of the structure. For mechanisms, it's not, it's not preferred because actually it wants to use as much force as possible to convert it into useful output motion. But for other cases, I can imagine that could happen. Thank okay. You. So, I see a question from the audience. So the question is, can you optimize the location, placement, and the shape of the several pockets of air inside a pneumatic finger? Um, 
So if I understand correctly, that is a little bit linked to this picture over here, where there are several pockets. And this, you could imagine this is a kind of pneumatic finger. Uh, well, actually so far what we see in, in, the, in the tests that we have done is that we get designs that are partly uh, a kind of a pressure converter and, and, and partly a con conventional mechanism. So if you look at these, for example, basically the pressure is picked up at, a, at the surface and then the rest of the structure, it looks like a conventional mechanism instead of being a lot of pockets like these designs. So whether that is caused by the fact that we have not included these two parts of large deflections and contact, or whether this actually this, this design that we get uh, consisting partly of a conventional mechanism is actually better, uh, we haven't answered that question yet. Okay, thank you. So any other questions? Okay, so thank you once again, Professor Langela. So let us move to the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is Professor uh, Yaj from Osaka University. The topic of his presentation is um, multi-fidelity design guided by topology optimization. Please, Professor Yaj. Okay. Uh, can you see me? Can you see this slide? Okay. No problem. Okay. Oh, thank you very much for inviting me as a speaker of the top webinar. Uh, I'm really honored by that. I'm Kenta Ryaji of Osaka University, Japan. So today I'd like to talk about uh, our recent paper entitled Marge Fidelity Design Guided by Topology Optimization, uh, which is published in SMO in 2020. <clears throat> okay. I'll Okay, here is the outline of my talk today. The time is limited, so I present only the key points in our paper. Uh, as numerical examples, two optimization problems dealing with uh, turbulent flows are introduced today. So, the, as you know, the topology optimization is a powerful tool uh, for generating novel designs. Uh, these are our previous works. As you can see, very interesting structures can be obtained by topology optimization. By the way, there are fundamental issues of topology optimization. So solving optimization problems become hard when dealing with complex physics such as turbulence flow because the topology optimization cannot avoid multimodality. As a result, the massive computational costs for getting a local optimum and sometimes patient parameter study are necessary. So I think uh, these are the uh, reason why most of topology optimization has not been implemented in commercial software except linear elastic problems. In the other research community of topology optimization, there is March Fidelity Design Optimization, which is a popular framework in multidisciplinary design optimization. In this framework, original complex optimization problem is efficiently solved by low fidelity analysis with a few high fidelity analysis. Here, uh, we would like to emphasize that such dividing the original problem into low and high fidelity problems is very important for solving practical design optimization problems. In fact, many papers are tended to construct topology optimization with low fidelity model. These are examples of recent weighted works. <coughs> for instance, on this, uh, uh, oh, so this paper used the first, uh, solve the false convection problem with turbulence problems. And this is replaced with a Darcy flow uh, equation, which is a linear equation. And the important features of such previous works is the low fidelity model is easily solvable compared with the original model. And this is the schematic figure right here. And uh, the key point of uh, the, this approach is that the parameter which is contained in low fidelity model is tuned so that a similar result with the original one can be obtained. <laughs> However, the, this tuning process is done before optimization. So the appropriate parameters in a low fidelity model is changed during the optimization because the tuning is done in a, simp uh, in a simple configuration, not an optimized one. Therefore, 
as a natural extension, uh, it is better that the various design candidates are generated by using such approach, and then the user selects the best one from the data sets. Based on this idea, we focus on this design optimization process. The key feature uh, is that low fidelity optimization is executed multiple times for generating various design candidates by varying uh, parameters. And by conducting high fidelity evaluation for them, we try to get a satisfactory solution from the data set. And this is a more detailed framework. The complex solution optimization problem is divided into two kinds of op optimization problems. The left one is the low fidelity optimization and right one is the high fidelity evaluation. As mentioned in the above figure, the key of the proposed framework is to construct a data set composed of various design candidates. So there is a natural question, how to define the parameter? We call it here seeding parameter. In our current work, we need to individually define a seeding parameter for each optimization problem. And finding appropriate seeding parameters is the most difficult task in our framework. But we believe that finding and studying such low fidelity topology optimization model are able to be important research topics as well as the standard approach for uh, directory solving complex topology optimization problems. Okay, now I'll show you two case studies. As a very simple example, the first is the pressure door minimization problem considering turbulence. This is the original problem in which the objective function is defined as the pressure drop and the con uh, volume constraint is con considered. And the velocity and the pressure are given by solving turbulence model and the random number is set to 10,000. So indirectly solving this original high fidelity problem, we define this low fidelity problem in which the velocity and pressure are given by solving laminar Navier Stokes equation at the low random number condition. <clears throat> For generating various design candidates, we define the a seeding parameter like this. This means low fidelity optimization is conducted under various Reynolds number condition between 30 to 120. Uh, that it uh, we assume that the satisfactory solution of the original Tavian's problem exists in the low Reynolds number flow problem. Let me show you the numerical example. These are the design candidates generated by solving a low fidelity optimization problem. As the high fidelity evaluation, we could find the best candidate here. Of course, the performance of the best candidate is important for determining that it is satisfactory one or not. Therefore, uh, we compare the simple reference design. As shown in these results, uh, the best design has a good performance compared with the reference one, at least. <clears throat> the second example is the heat sink design, considering turbulent heat transfer. In this example, the objective function is defined as the ratio of the thermal conductance and the pumping power. For indirectly solving this original high fidelity optimization problem, we define the low fidelity optimization problem like this. Here, the sum of fluid is modeled as laminar heat transfer, and the seeding parameters are defined for varying the Reynolds number and the heat transfer coefficient better here. The reason why we define that is the previous work indicated these parameters are important factors for uh, generating various patterns of topology optimized design. So, uh, in this example, it's uh, based on the uh, knowledge of the previous works results, okay? Let me show you the numerical example. Uh, by solving the low fidelity optimization problem, we got these design candidates and found the best one here. I'm showing this figure. The best design has a good performance compared with the reference one, at least. Of course, this best one is not a theoretical optimum in the original optimization problem. But this result indicates that the low fidelity of model has the potential to get a satisfactory solution for the practical users. Okay, let me summarize what we found. In this research, we propose a framework of multi fidelity design for topology of initial problems and applied to talent problems. As future works, we plan to tackle for application to design optimization problems considering other complex physics such as nonlinear structure mechanics. In addition, it is also interesting to construct a systematic strategy for determining formulation of low fidelity optimization problem. <clears throat> Lastly, 
I'll show you our recent related works. So if you are interested in these works too, please read these papers or contact us freely. Okay, thank you very much for kind attention. Thank you, Professor Yaj, for your very nice presentation. Now it's open for discussion. Any comments or questions? I could ask one. So uh, thank you for an interesting uh, presentation. So uh, you, mm -hmm. as I understand it, you do the low fidelity optimization and then you evaluate with a high fidelity model. But did you ever try yes. to do an actual optimization with a high fidelity model? Because in principle, it could be that you could do a much better structure there than the ones you obtain yeah. on the low, mo yeah. uh, low fidelity model. Yes. So yes, it, it's a good. Yes, so but the this research focus on uh, obtaining a satisfactory solution. It's not optimized one, so because the satisfactory solution is um, it's good for uh, practical users. So, and uh, of course the uh, high fit directory solving the high fit problem is the most uh, precise optimization problem. But uh, we try to. Uh, get easily and uh, useful. I need to get the useful uh, optimized one. Okay, because sometimes when we did this stuff where we optimized with a low fidelity model, we would find that it was actually performing quite bad with the high fidelity model compared. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so you may be lucky or you may be unlucky, I guess. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I also so have Professor a Yaj, Okay, Professor yeah. Yaj, I think this is a very interesting work. I have a question. So in your method, uh, during the process of optimization, is there any mechanism uh, to adjust the, your low fidelity model based on the oh, yeah. house obtained during the process of optimization? Yes, it, it's uh, it's a good question because low fidelity, the accuracy of the low fidelity model is the most important in this research. But uh, uh, now I cannot find the systematic approach for uh, getting a, a very precise model compared with the high fidelity model. It's now uh, we are uh, based on the um, previous work's results and. Uh, estimate the, what 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 is a good shape so designer considered what is a good shape so and assume such shape is good in the high fidelity model too this is the uh, assumption of the uh, our framework yeah i also have one question you see the, yeah. i think the your 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 work is very important because uh, topology yeah. optimization is often used for the structure parts optimization. But mm -hmm. people want us to optimize the whole structure, design the whole structure yeah. or layout. Mm -hmm. So you need a, a low fidelity model for the whole structure. I mean, mm -hmm. this is really difficult. I read your paper, you mentioned the difficult. Do you have some more experience about that? How to construct, I mean, the, Full model, the uh, low fidelity, I mean, the model. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, it's you, very not difficult, difficult to... I think. <laughs> Whole model. So, um, for example, yeah, so the airplane design, know. they want the airplane. Yeah. <laughs> airplane design. Yeah. So you want the low fidelity model. This is the, the requirement from practice. Yeah. Yes, so it's very important question because so maybe that for designing such airplane like this, so the model based design is uh, often used for uh, in such case, and in the model based design, the very cheap and first uh, solver is very important to work such tools. So I think this. This idea, so the low, um, using the low fidelity model, is uh, important for uh, using such uh, 
designing tools, I think. Okay. Well, thank you, Professor Yaj, once again for your very interesting uh, presentation. So let us move to the next speaker. Much. Okay, okay. Uh, let us move to the next speaker. The next speaker is Professor Silva from uh, Brazil, a federal university. Uh, the topic of, of his presentation is a, start, a strategy based on strength to kinetic energy ratio to ensure stability and convergence in topology optimization of globally resonating one material structure. So Professor Sierra, please. Thank you, Professor Ku and Professor Chang. Uh, can you see my slide now? Yeah? Okay. Okay, it's, it's okay. perfect. Bye. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Olavo Silva. I'm a researcher at Federal University of Santa Catarina, Brazil. I will talk about uh, a strategy to obtain uh, globally resonating one material structures by topology optimization. This is a co-work uh, with Professor Neves from Technical University of Lisbon. Uh, firstly, oops. What is a resonating structure? It's a structure excited by external loads with frequency close or coincident uh, to one of its structural resonances, uh, which is related to a specific uh, vibration mode being activated. Here we have two examples of applications, PZT MEMS and energy harvesting applications. And how to obtain a resonating structure by topology optimization we can find two main groups, two main methods, methods based on eigenvalue problems and methods uh, based on the forced vibration response of structures. In both methods, the authors report some difficulties in reach the desired uh, resonance frequencies. In the present work, we choose to use the approach based on forced vibration problems. So our objective here is to maximize a given vibration measure obtained by solving harmonic problem for a given unique excitation frequency, applying topology optimization, applying the same method for one material structures with a simple density filter. Um, in this work, uh, the objective is to obtain globally resonant structures. We want to avoid very localized resonant vibration eventually caused by weak regions connected to massive parts. So uh, we choose to work with the total input power in its complex form, the complex input power considering proportional damping. Its real part is the active input power, which is the effective power injected into a system by all the loads. Uh, representing the global behavior of the structure. Here we can see the strain energy, and here we can see the net key energy, and here the strain energy. And uh, the, uh, the objective is to maximize the active power to obtain uh, resonating structures. But we have also the reactive pow uh, power. The reactive input power is the imaginary part of the complex input, input power, and it will be useful later it is proportional to the difference between the potential or strain and the kinetic energies, indicating when they are equivalent. Here uh, we have uh, the frequency plots of the active input power and of the reactive input power for the um, initial design. We can see that uh, different from the active input power, the reactive input power has positive and negative values, resonances and anti-resonances, bringing difficulties to the optimization processes. So we transform the reactive input power in another measure, in another equivalent measure, the strain to kinetic energy ratio. This ratio is positive and well-behaved in frequency, and it presents a value one, for resonances and oscillating around one, because a mode when a mode is activated, uh, the potential energy is equal to the kinetic energy. 
Uh, so firstly, uh, let's try to maximize the active input power, the real part of the input power, applying only a constraint on the volume and side constraints. Uh, we will max maximize it for a single excitation frequencies, one at a time. In our previous paper, uh, we investigated the benefits of using an additional static load case to complement the objective function, and we are using it here. The, optimizer, uh, uh, the optimization method, uh, uses, uh, we use the GCMMA, so all functions are normalized. Here we have the first example considering an excitation frequency of 250 hertz. The uh, final result is a non serial one uh, design with regions with intermediate densities. And despite this, uh, the procedure uh, reached a resonance of the active input power at the desired frequency and the evolution of the scaled functions appears to be stable. However, if you see the evolution of the strain to kinetic energy ratio, it's clear that the resonance is oscillating around the excitation frequency throughout the process. In this example, uh, the ratio starts from a value uh, less than one and evolves to one with a resonance reaching the excitation frequency. However, this oscillation, as zoom here, seems to be uh, harming to the process. Uh, the signal cures for other excitation frequency, 400 Hertz and 600 Hertz. Uh, the strain to kinetic energy ratio can start from a value less, uh, less than one and also from a value uh, greater than one, depending on the, the initial uh, design. However, we can see here uh, the same oscillation in both cases, and the final designs are not fully developed. Uh, here, uh, a zoom, uh, we you can see the resonance of the active input power oscillating around the excitation frequency of 400 Hertz. Uh, consequently, we have abrupt variations of the sensitivities of the active input power. At the left side of the resonance, we have more influence of the stiffness and the right side of the resonance, we have more influence of mass. Uh, so, uh, what we propose in this work, we propose not to reach exactly a resonance. We propose uh, to avoid a match between the resonance frequency and the excitation frequency. And how to do that? By imposing a constraint on the strain to kinetic energy ratio. If this ratio is less than one for the, the initial design, uh, so we will keep it less than one along the optimization process not exceeding this red zone. And if this ratio is greater than one for the initial design, so we will keep it greater than one along the process, not exceeding this red zone. And due to the GC MMA, uh, the implementation of this constraint is made according uh, to this adaptation, where this gap was obtained after uh, some tests. First, let's apply this uh, strategy. Uh, this is the example for the excitation frequency 250 Hertz. Uh, we can see now a well-defined um, layout, uh, zero one uh, design. The resonance frequent, uh, frequency almost uh, reached the excitation frequency, but here we can't see it uh, due to the discretization of this frequency plot. Here we have the evolution of the normalized measures with fewer GC MMA outer interactions. And here, the evolution of the strain to kinetic energy ratio. We see a more stable evolution um, uh, the, the without oscillation around one. Consequently, the almost uh, reach the resonance is always at the same side of the excitation frequency and the, pros, uh, the process proceeds with uh, stability. The same occurs for uh, 400 Hertz here with a well-defined layout and with a stable evolution with R uh, less than one. Uh, the same occurs for uh, 600 Hertz here with a nice design. And here in this case, the initial design 
um, starts with the strain to kinetic energy ratio uh, greater than one. And so the second resonance of the active input power is activated. And here uh, we can see uh, the, that the resonance now is very close to the target frequency and always at the same side at each iteration. Consequently, we have a stable changing on the derivatives throughout the process. And in this article, we also present some issues about applying uh, this strategy for excitation frequencies below the first resonance of the initial design. Uh, there is a strong dependence of the uh, static load the additional load case. Uh, however, we can uh, deal with it and we can obtain interesting and resonant, resonant designs with the desired uh, um, excitation uh, frequency. Uh, this, we, ha we don't have uh, uh, the, this uh, design is in the paper, but here we did uh, other tests and examples with other geometries and other body conditions. And even using the half side projection, we have a nice uh, designs, resonant designs. And the next steps, uh, we need to, to deal with stress constraints. We need to study the effect of the dumping uh, on the strain to kinetic energy ratio. We need to study robust optimization and uh, the relation with measures. Uh, we, need, uh, we can uh, maximize other measures uh, even a uh, global measure, or we need to apply a constraint to obtain uh, desired values for displacement or reaction forces, for example. Uh, this work we are doing with partnership with Professor Eduardo Lenz Cardoso from Joinville. And thank you very much for, for the opportunity. Well, thank you very much, Professor Silva. So I think it is time uh, for our uh, general discussion. We have about 15 minutes to exchange ideas. I think now we can accept the questions or remarks to all speakers. It is open for all presentations. Of course, uh, including the questions to, to Professor Serva's presentation. Okay. Okay, I have a... A question to, to Silva. So thank you for an interesting uh, presentation. Is it correctly understood that this relies on GC MMA, meaning that if you use the standard MMA, you could still jump to the other side. So you are using the GC MMA has a line search, which makes you stay on one side. Uh, is that correctly understood? Yeah, uh, we use the GC MMI, uh, MMA solver uh the, the full configuration of the gc mma uh, in dynamic problems we changed the some parameters uh for uh the the the, the first step of the gc mma and we uh, uh become became uh impressive because uh, even using gc mma you have uh, uh, that oscillations that we see uh, near the the maximum Mm -hmm. of the function um, and uh, uh, we, 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 th we think about uh, the, 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 the kind of approximation that we are using uh, if it's correct or not but, but uh, uh, this problem uh, was solved with GC MMA and even we found these problems of, of yeah. oscillations. I, I understand that, but I think I was more referring to your final formulation. So when you introduce a constraint on R, then that only works because you use TCMMA, right? If you use standard MMA, okay. it wouldn't work because it could still jump to the other okay. side. Yeah. Because of the GC MMA, okay? Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. That's it. But it's very interesting. Thank you. Nice, Professor. So I have questions for Silva. So, so I, I think when, when the excitation frequency is very close to the resonant frequency, during optimization, the resonance could be jumped to the left or right of this uh, excitation frequency. So did you notice this, this kind of jump from the left to right or right to left? Or did you notice some other, this mode switch, I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, here, uh, we 
we don't deal with the, this kind of problem uh, of mode switching uh, because uh, we choose uh, initial geometry with a well uh, spaced uh, uh, eigen modes. And uh, we can see here uh, also uh, that when uh, the method uh, uh, target a resonance, uh, difficultly uh, another uh, resonance reach the excitation frequency. This is our experience in the this, in this problem. But I mean, when the excitation frequency is very close to the resonance, then resonance will be, you know, moves yeah. from the left or to the right yeah. or something like. That. Then the yeah. topology will uh, change significantly. Yeah. yeah, we can see here in the. Uh, can can you see my 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 screen? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, here, uh, for example, from the original um, design to the optimized design, uh, the method choose the, 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 the closest, the nearest uh, resonance to, to reach. And we can see here in the evolution of R and in the evolution of the normalized functions. Uh, it target the, 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 uh, the, the, the near uh, eigen uh, audio resonance and Converge to this resonance. This is our uh, experience uh, with this this problem. Okay. Can I, okay. Thank you. Can I ask a technical uh, questions? In this okay. MMA, how many iterations do you need? Normally, uh, sorry? Sorry. Uh, in general, TCMA there's a inner uh, line search, right? How oh, many okay. iterations do you need to stabilize it? Okay. Okay, uh, in TCMMA, uh, we reached uh, almost, uh, for the initial designs, uh, five inner iterations. And when the resonance is re reached, we uh, reached uh, almost nine, eight internal GCMMA iterations. But when we use the half side projection, uh, uh, we have a, a raw situation. We have uh, the, the limit of the internal GCMMA iterations. But uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, very good, very nice question. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for Jinping. So Jinping, still okay. there? Okay, yeah, I can hear you. Uh, yeah, Jinping. So my question is about uh, uh, what is the size, geometrical size of your uh, unit cells? For uh, what, uh, what, is, uh, what is the relationship with the wavelengths? I think uh, 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 such as one, uh, one times of the wavelength or two times or half, even half of the wavelengths. Yeah, uh, that's my question. Thank you. Uh, uh, I can't remember clearly the size of the unit cell. Uh, I think I, I check, I check it. Uh, maybe I, sh I should check my, uh, check it. Any other questions? Can I ask one uh, to uh, Jianbing? You use a two scale okay. modeling to design a band gap structures, right? You said, which take a boundary connection into account. Have you yes. compa uh, compared with uh, you know, periodic designs? How much you improve in terms of uh, bandwidth? Uh, sorry, can you repeat again the question? I mean, you 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 design a band gap structures, right? Use yes. two skills, consider macrostructure designs and performance in um, uh, large scale structure performance. Yes. And uh, did you compare if you like for your? Uh, did you compare for use periodic structures instead of the structure designs? How much you improve the band gap? I think maybe uh, I missed mean, it. What, what do you mean by using the periodic uh, structure? Uh, we you use, the use, periodicity. A, you know, use a one, one material, like the, uh, you know, the, uh, what's called, the, in your introductions, people use the periodic uh, phonolic uh, band gaps. Uh, I see, I see. Uh, actually, we have a verification of the, uh, you know, the, the traditional, you know, uh, uh, what you just mentioned, the traditional way of using the block wave solution to calculate one yes. cell to get the band gap. And uh, 
maybe I should uh, share my screen. Uh, I, I'll try, try to share my screen. Uh. Okay. Dr. Do. Yes. Okay, please uh, ask your questions. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so you can see these slices. Uh, uh, the, the, the picture on the left upper uh, side, uh, it's uh, the, uh, the band it's gap obtained picture. by using the traditional yes. uh, method. Mm, there's uh, no slice showing. Oh, yes. No. Oh, no. No. oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, maybe I should. Uh, let me see. Okay. Can you see these slides now? Yes, yeah, now yeah. see it. Okay, can okay. you see the slides? Yes. yes. No problem. Okay. Yeah, the picture on the on the yeah on the upper left upper left uh, left side, it's uh, the band gap uh, obtained by using the traditional. It's from the literature by Wang, uh, Shim, and uh, Burton. Yeah, you can see the band gap calculated is from zero point six one to zero point eight two. So the uh, the picture on the uh, left lower side is uh, our calculation result. Uh, so you can see we find the band gap at uh, the similar area, but there are some difference, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the uh, values. Uh, we have uh, actually there are some uh, the difference. Uh, I think uh, it come from several aspects. Uh, firstly, uh, in our model, we consider a, a finite size of the macrostructure. But in the uh, traditional way, they just consider one unit cell and no macrostructure considered. And uh, secondly, uh, we consider the uh, uh, specified uh, excitation loading and uh, the specified boundary in our model. But in the traditional ways, uh, uh, it, it does not uh, concern any uh, uh, specified boundary and uh, uh, is uh, uh, except for the uh, periodic uh, periodic uh, boundary uh, on the unit cell. So I think uh, uh, such a difference uh, make uh, the results a little different uh, from our uh, between our result and the traditional result. But basically, the band band gap, uh, the location of the band gap, uh, they are very close. Uh. Oh. But the bandwidth. You know how big the band is. Uh, uh, here you can see the value, the, the band. Yeah, it's uh, from 0 0.61 to 0 0.82. This, this is um, the white. I'm more curious. Use this, uh, you know, two-level optimization. Will can you get a much better, much bigger band gap? Because you know, the two two skill optimization is much more uh, heavy compared to, to the macrostructure designs, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So, uh, we didn't do that comparison because uh, in this example, we just calculate the band gap. We do not do optimization. But in the following examples, we do optim two scale optimization, but we didn't compare it to the traditional uh, with because uh, the, the, the microstructure is optimized and uh, the microstructure is also optimized. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I see uh, Dr. Do uh, would like to ask a, a question. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Dr. Do. Yes, yeah, thank you. And uh, I want to ask uh, uh, Sylvan about this question. The first is, uh, have you considered the objective function by using a ratio between the active power to compliance? Uh, in your case, you consider a weighted sum of these uh, two objective functions. The second is, uh, have you considered uh, using uh, constant of uh, r equals zero. This one uh, you will uh, allow you to check the resonance peak. In your case, it's very close to resonance peak, but uh, not exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Uh, here. Uh, uh, the, the use of the static compliance, uh, we try to don't use it. But uh, uh, a, a lot of uh, authors use a sum uh, of the compliance of the, the, the measure, for example, from zero or from near zero to after the first resonance. When we add the component of, of the near zero in this uh, sum, uh, we are also adding some, something like the static effect of the, 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 the objective function. But uh, we, uh, in this work, we was interested in uh, just one frequency. So uh, we choose uh, to use the static 
compliance in an additional uh, static load phase. And we pay attention to, to give a, a, a more weight to the active input power and a lower uh, weight to the static compliance. And about the, the, the value of R, uh, uh, we did some uh, tests to choose uh, the, the best value to, to, to almost reach the resonance. This is a very good question. Uh, what is a, an almost resonant uh, structure? And so we need to deal with a damping. We need to deal with a, a spectral a discretization, a lot of, a lot of things to, to, to do. But a very, very, very nice question. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. OK. OK. We have so many interesting discussions on today's presentations, uh, but uh, it seems like I had to stop the discussions now since our webinar has been lasting for almost one and a half hours. So at this position, I and the Professor Chen would like to thank you all for joining us. A special thanks also go to our invited speakers. So finally, I and the Professor Chen would like to remind you that the next top webinar will be hosted by Professor Jamie Guest from USA on August 27th. So thank you once again. I hope everybody will have a very nice day. So looking forward to seeing you soon in the next webinar. Okay, so is there an announcement uh, the organizer would like to made, make? Jim? No, you have uh, announced it, thank you. So the next webinar will be in August 27th, thank you, yeah. Okay, okay. okay. Thank you for joining. You. Yeah. See you next Thank time. You Thank you. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a nice bye -bye. day. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.